It was, a, it was a Friday in late June. I'm a teenager and uh, don't have my license, but I have a dad who thinks I need to be hired, thinks I need a job. And so I don't need to go early in the morning to the marketplace and see if I can get hired like these workers in our parable. No, my dad, he drives me to the Markham Employment Office. <laughs> and uh, just want to pause and just say, uh, teenagers, young adults, just so you understand, I'm a teenager, and this is no internet, no iPhone, no website to do it online, in case you're wondering, Jesse. I got me a clipboard and a pen, and I go in. And uh, did I mention I'm a teenager with no skills? Did I mention that? So when it comes to the after populating your, like, your contact information, that kind of, I knew what to do. And then uh, I left the house line there, and I'm mowing through, and I'm looking at my skills, and there's a lot of little ticky boxes I'm not ticking. But there's something in me I'm a punk teenager who thinks he needs a better job. There's something in me that I kind of expect a little more. Last summer I had a little job. I was landscape, a little painting, a little weeding, a little cutting grass. But this year, maybe this year would be different. This year, maybe I could get a job, you know, at an insurance company, their mail room, air conditioning, eight to four, lunch, breaks, talk to people. That's my little expectation. And again, knowing that you got to have skills to do certain things. But yeah, but I, I think I got this. So I finished uh, the application profile, whatever, and I walk up and I put it into the counter. And there's this really friendly woman there. She had a little name tag. I don't know her name from back. Let's just call her Diane. Diane. And she's friendly. She takes my little clipboard. And then there's a little frown that Phone. It's the employment office. Because <laughs> my dad's in the garage. It's the employment office. I think, it, yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. So I take my bike, I put it up against the wall of the garage, and I go inside. Teenagers, I get this right. It's attached. Hi. <clears throat> and you just you just hear the cheerfulness. Good news, John. Got us a little job match. Uh-huh. What's that? There's a man who wants someone to come dig ditches in his backyard. <laughs> yeah? Oh, he's putting in a screened-in porch, and what's that? The caterpillar can't go through the building. It's too close. And they need people with shovels to dig for three days in the heat of the day. <laughs> okay, thanks. Pause. So I don't pause in this, this conversation, but I pause here. So I've got this expectation. I'm a punk kid, and I think I expect a little bit more, a little more consideration for my lack of skill. So I, I, this is what I do. <clears throat> yeah, Diane, ooh, I, don't, I don't think so. No, I think the answer is no. Yes. Yeah, thanks. What's that? Yeah, you have a good weekend, too. Now, that was a lot of years ago. But I wish I could do a do-over. I hang up the phone, and the do-over would be this. I would come out of the family room, and I would go left through the kitchen, through the deck, through the backyard, over the fence, and go to my friend's house and play, wait for it, Atari Space Invaders. But no, 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 no. I don't go left, I go right, back out toward my bike. And as I'm getting onto my bicycle, I hear this voice from the garage. Who was that on the phone? Teenagers, I speak your language. What is your language? We are, as teenagers, 
We're hardwired for what? Two things. Mumble and vagueness. Mumble, 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 mumble. Employment office, offer job, mumble, mumble, start Monday, grumble, mumble, mumble, mumble. And I said, no. And I'm trying to pick up some speed as I leave. And then he says, and I'm sure fathers, you guys know there's the dad handbook on parenting and under employment for teenagers, there's this line. And he did not mumble and he was not vague. He said, you know what, John? And some of you remember my dad and how he would say it. There's no such thing as a bad job. The only bad job is not having a job. <laughs> Just so you know, Sophie, Annie, and Benjamin, I have the same handbook. <laughs> so you know when there's a correct answer. So, hello, Diane. And then I asked the silliest question. Is that job still available? <laughs> oh, it is. It is. Okay. Good. Yeah, yeah I, th I think I could do that. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Okay, maybe write that down. Mm hmm Okay, good. It's three days. Yeah, minimum wage. Yeah, $8.50. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what's that? Bring gloves. Uh-huh. Sunscreen. Uh-huh. Yeah, thank thanks, Diane. You have, a, you have a good weekend. Okay, bye. I have a job. I have a job. How come I'm not so cheerful like Diane? What is it behind the disappointment of our expectations when somehow our heart expectations we have of things, of how things should play out? There's this presumption that we maybe, I don't know, just this once, get a little more consideration. Maybe I deserve a little bit more. And it is this parable of the workers in the vineyard where Jesus is going to tell a made-up story in order to make this true point. What is the true point of the workers in the vineyard? And it's this, the kingdom of heaven that is the upside-down kingdom that Jesus invites us into. That kingdom, that one right there, it's going to upset our heart expectations of reward. It will. And I invite you, if you have your Bibles, would you please turn to Matthew chapter 20, and we'll pick it up in verse 1. Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who goes out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard, and he agrees to pay them a denarius for the day. Now, I'm going to invite you to take some notes. I'm going to give you some little things to hang it on. So this parable can be divided into two major acts. Act one, act two. Like two major divisions of a play. Act one and act two can be distinguished from each other according to what? Location, time, and activity. Act number one is going to take place in the marketplace during the daytime, and we're going to hire, wait for it, workers from the first to the last, act one. Act two is going to take place in the vineyard at evening time, wait for it, and we're going to what? Pay the workers from last to first. Two acts. Act number one, hired by the landlord. Now, maybe you've heard this parable before. Or maybe you haven't. But if you've heard this parable before, you already know how this goes. And it was read to us this morning. And it's, it's unsettling 
Why? Because it's what? It's so unfair. It's unsettling because the way it ends seems so unfair. And when you're looking at a parable, you want to find two things in the story. You want to find yourself, and you want to find God in the story. That's how Jesus creates, the master teacher creates the stories, trying to find your place. As an audience, you're trying to look in and see where you are. Hello, early riser, first group of workers, got there at 530 Grew up in the church, got there at 6 o'clock, wouldn't want to be late, got hired, worked all the day, stayed after quitting time, 15 minutes. It's not fair. It's unsettling as well because God is in the story, represented by the landlord, landowner, owner of the vineyard, and we discover something about his generosity to undeserving people. And so this parable is going to do what? It's going to force us to rethink and re-understand, re-examine our understanding of what it means when you think that you've put in the work that you should get this reward. What is the point of this parable? That the kingdom of heaven will upset your heart expectations of reward. Let's jump in. Chapter 20, verse 1. And this is the very first word of that chapter 20, and it starts off with four. And as soon as you see the word four, you're like, okay, what four could also be because, and you think, okay, why is this four here? It seems like it's talking about something happening in that direction, and we need to turn and pay our ten- pay attention to see what's happening before. What was the end of chapter 19 that leads into this parable? We have two acts. We have two conversations in chapter 19. Conversation number one, the refusal. Conversation number two, the question. Conversation number one, Jesus and the rich young ruler. Conversation number two, Jesus and Peter and the disciples. Conversation number one. There's this rich young ruler that comes up, runs up to Jesus. He's got influence. He's got wealth. He's having this conversation with Jesus What more can I do to get into eternal life? And Jesus looks at him and says, sell everything you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 16. Same story, book of Mark. Mark says this. And Jesus looked on him with compassion because he was choosing to rely on his own wealth and security than coming and following Jesus. And the disciples are watching that happen. And Jesus makes a couple of comments. He says something that you remember, it's memorable, about a camel going in through the eye of a needle. End of conversation number one. Conversation number two, the question, verse 27 of 19, there he is, then, (laughs) then Peter. Then Peter blurting out the question that's on the mind of the rest of the disciples. Then Peter says, we have left everything to follow you. What then will we have? Translation, we just did what he refused to do. What's our reward? And Jesus could have just dismissed it with a little bit of a rebuke and say, Peter, Peter, Peter. Oh, no, 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 no. Jesus says there's something good about that question and there's something wrong about that question. The good part is that I'm going to affirm something in you, Peter. And the second part is the warning. And the warning is our parable. Jesus says, okay, Peter, you asked a direct question, I'll give you a direct answer. Matthew 20, sorry, Matthew uh, 19, verses 28 and 29, Jesus gives them the answer. Jesus says... As I'm looking out forward, ahead, over all the centuries, there will be a day at the renewal of all things. And on that day, yes, Peter, you and the disciples, you will share the authority with me at that time. But Peter also, anyone who's come and followed me, 
That glorious reward awaits anyone who comes and follows me. That's your direct answer. But Jesus also wants to warn Peter about his question, about rewards. And so he says, in verse 9, chapter 19, verse 30, he says this. He makes this statement. But many who are first, cue the young rich ruler, many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. That is our outline. <laughs> Two acts, Two conversations, two statements, two pronouncements. Statement number one, I just said it, many who are first. It acts as this first statement. I'm about to tell you a parable. It starts as a bookend here. It runs out until verse 15. And then on the backside, on verse 16, Jesus says almost verbatim the same thing he said back there in 1930. He says it a little differently. He takes this clause, and he takes this clause, and he transposes them. And he says, so, based on the parable I just told you, conclusion, my editorial comment on what I just said, so that when you know that this, the parable is over because I have just given you the complete answer, here's the ending, the concluding statement. So, Therefore, the last will be first, and the first will be last. What is the parable? Let's jump right into it now. The kingdom of heaven is like, that kingdom of heaven is like, is this typical introductory statement. He does them all the way. Here we go. The kingdom of heaven is like, I don't know, like a, like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is it's like a leaven that a woman took. It's like a merchant in search of fine pearls. It's, it's like a woman taking the leaven. It's, it's, it's like this. It's like a net thrown into the sea. In our parable, it's about a landlord, landowner, going out early in the morning to hire workers for the vineyard. Now, this next section, verses 3 to 5, happens fairly quickly. Fairly quickly. In other words, there is this narr narration compression that covers a lot of part of the day. And he says that after that first hiring at 6 a.m., that he goes repeatedly, now three times, he goes out, what, about 9 in the morning, about noon, and about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and he hires additional workers. The fact that it's crunched together like that reflects what? They're not really a big part of the story. No, no, no. Sure, they will enhance the story line, but the emphasis is going to be what? On the first group and on the last group. Chapter 20, verse 6. Jesus says in this story that the landlord, the landowner, he goes out again about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. You are the audience in that first time hearing it, and you're going to go, what? One working hour of daylight left, and you're still hiring people? Ooh, you're making a mess here. I want to see how this plays out, how these people are going to get paid. And sure enough... There's this verbal exchange among the different workers. If section three through five, when it's compressed, does it really matter because you're not really part of the story? You are extras in this movie. <laughs> you, you, you guys, we're going to give you a talking role. You can say something. So Jesus asks this group, this last group, when he comes, Jesus comes to the marketplace, sees these people standing around. So Jesus says, what are, you, what are you even doing standing around here all day long, doing nothing? Why are you here? And they say, because no one has hired us. That's not a judgment on them, just they haven't been hired. And then Jesus says, you also go and work in my vineyard. Curtain, act one, closes, the land, hired by the landlord. Moves very quickly now. Act two. <laughs> Title, annoyed by the landlord. And we pick it up in verse eight. 
when evening came. Sure, sundown, it's time to pay the people. When evening came. And so the owner of the vineyard, the landlord, the Lord, he comes, the landowner, he says this to his foreman. He says, foreman, I want you to do two things. I want you to do what? I want you to call all the workers together, and then the two instructions, we hear one of them because it's recorded right there in verse 8. We don't hear about the other, but we find out later what he said. First instruction we heard was what? Pay them all, beginning with the last ones. And then going on up to the first. And then we're going to find out later and pay them a denarius. Now, the master teacher has set up this imaginary story deliberately, intentionally, to what? To flip it and to shock the audience into the big ending. And so, he tells them, start with the ones hired last. Now, th think about that. Had he started with the first group, what's pretty typical of the first group? First group is what? They come up, oh, my back. I've been working. Oh, I've been working. That's a lot of words to say I'm thirsty. <laughs> he says, you get paid first, and you just walk away. You naturally just leave. You got paid, you walk away. You're not going to stick around and see what everybody else got. So Jesus has to hold them there because he has to see the whole thing ha hangs on what? That the fact that they have to see what the others are paid. So, verse 9, there's a lot of words there to say the workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came. The last group comes. They come in and they get their denarius. Wow. And you can just say, wait, What? I just got 12 times more what I, ooh, there's our word, what I expected. Maybe he made a mistake. And so they, they sort of walk away. All the extras in the movie, apparently they got paid. We don't know. Don't know. But they're gone. Then, verse 10, a lot of words to describe the first group. So when those who were hired first came... They came, and here's our word again, what? What is it? They expected, based on what we just saw, they expected we would get more. Right? More. Longer hours, more pay. That's how it works. And by the way, time out. That's a good thing. Our economy needs that. This is God's generosity. This is not a commentary on how to run a business. All right. So, yeah. They show up and expect to receive what? Receive more. And then Jesus, the master teacher, at the very end of verse 10, says, and each one received a denarius. Wait, I think I, I forgot a word. It's a four-letter word. It's right here. And each one also received a denarius. Jesus drops that in there for special effect, you know, just, to, just so you know, to emphasize the point, what? That the last group and the first group also, you each got the same amount of pay. And guess what? Verse 11. And when they received it, they were what? They had a job. When they received it, they were cheerful like Diane who had a job. No, they were what? They began to grumble. Began to grumble. Now, at this point in the story, you're listening to it and you're like, okay, you know what? Not that you're going to talk in church, but you kind of lean over to somebody and go, I'm with the first group. I would be grumbling too. It's not fair. Right? So, object lesson. Product placement. Tim Hortons. 10 pack, 10 bits. 
So you go into uh, Tim Hortons, you do drive through and you get your little pack of Timbits, and uh, you paid for 10, and you open up your little box of Timbits, and just a sec. Babe, there's only, there's only nine here. What's that? I know. And you march right up to that counter, or you, I don't park the car, come back around. <laughs> Give me. Um, it's written right there, 10. I only got nine. It's not fair. Paid for 10, got nine. Thank you. Yeah, we, we grumble. We know what we want. It's fair. Oh, by the way, just curious. What happens if you would have got 11? <laughs> I don't know. Just curious what you would do. I'll tell you what you wouldn't do. Just grab that. Can I speak to the manager, please? <laughs> Is this a way to run a business in a period of high inflation? Your bottom line, giving away extra timbits. <laughs> oh, no. What do we do? We take a picture. We Instagram it. Hashtag blessed. <laughs> Why? We, that's how we go. That's how we roll. If it works to our advantage, absolutely. If it's nine, we get ripped off. It's not fair. So they began to grumble, and we would too. They began to grumble. And so at the end of verse 11, they began to grumble. There's your word, against. Against the landlord. He's not even there, but against the landlord. And which trying to means anybody who kind of listens... I got a little grievance. I'm going to grumble with you. Grumble, 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 grumble. And then at verse 12, the against the landlord now becomes to the landlord. You, la, la, grumpy, grumpy, la, and then complain, complain, complain. You did all that. And this complaint of the first group of workers has three layers to it. Layer number one, has to do with their wages. Complaint number two has to do with their rights, and complaint number three has to do with their envy. Their wages, their rights, and their envy. Chapter 20, verse 12. Their wages. Uh, we... Uh, we have a problem with this transaction that just went down. You have committed two injustices. Injustice number one is that you have not taken into consideration what? We have borne the burden of the work. We have worked longer hours. You have not noticed the difference between our 12-hour shift and this one-hour shift. You have not taken that into consideration. That's an injustice. Injustice number two is that we have borne the heat of the day. That is that all day long, that oppressive hot, hot heat all day does not compare to the coolness of the afternoon for that one-hour shift. We're grumpy, we're upset because you've messed with this whole wage and work, and we're not happy. Complaint number two has to do with their rights. Question for you. As you look at verse 12 there, what's the first word? Oh, you high and exalted landlord, Thank you for giving me a job. Deference, deference, honor, honor. Oh no, these workers, these workers. There's no sense of gratefulness. They're just angry. These. The third part of their complaint has to do with their envy. 
Verse 12, last part. And you have made them equal to us. You've done that. You've made them equal to us. What is lost on this first group when they make that statement? As that first statement, as that first group starts to think about their grumpy part about their envy, their focus is what? It's not on the fact what happened at six o'clock in the morning. Don't miss that. They did not wake up that morning and expect to get hired. I'm sorry, and, and decide to work. Today is a good day to work, and they decided to get work, and so they went and started pulling off the grapes off the vines and just did all that and didn't get paid. No, no, no. They had a job because they were hired. They don't focus on that. Oh, no, 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 no. They focus on comparing themselves to the good fortune of this other group who God, landlord, decides that they're going to give them something that they don't deserve, and they don't celebrate that. And that's part of my anger. That's part of my grumbling. You've made them equal to us. They're envious. Any envious people in the crowd? I'm envious. I am. What does envy do? Envy envy does two things. (laughs) It betrays the true condition of our heart. And it shapes our relationships with people. It just does. Because envy very quickly moves to resentment. I'm envious. You know what I'm envious of? I'm envious of people's clothes. Are you writing this down? C-L-O-T-H-E-S. That's right. Write it down. John is envious of other people's fashion. Their connections, their looks, their opportunities, their talents, their health, their earnings, and their success. And somehow in this race of life, if somebody pulls in front of me and they don't even know they're pulling in front of me in this race of life and they have clothes and my filter that I see something lacking in me but they have, I'm envious. Am I grateful for what I have? No, I want that. That's what I want. I want what they have. That's my starter list of categories. Do you you have some on your list? Because there's something about this statement that God, you owe me. You do. You owe me. Because if things would be different, what? I don't know, relationally, professionally, financially, I'd be in a different place. I wish I could be like... And we become envious. So that completes verse 12, the three-layer complaint of the first workers. And Jesus, now master teacher, uses the voice of the landlord to describe how God comes into the picture and how he gives undeserving people something that they could actually enjoy and have. Watch how he does it. Verse 13. He's very intentional, but he's kind. Jesus said to one of them. He just finds one of them. In verse 13, he says, you know what? I wasn't being unfair to you, friend. And in the wisdom and the beauty of how Jesus tells the story, in the same three-layer Wages, rights, and envy. Jesus responds in the voice of the landlord and says, okay, let's go through them one at a time. But we're not going to talk about fairness. How about we talk about it and let's reframe this in terms of what? Generosity. And I'm going to give you three rhetorical questions on the theme of generosity as I address your wages, your rights, and your envy. 
Question number one about your wages. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? I don't owe you anything. I delivered on my payment that we agreed at the hiring stage this morning. Remember verse 2? And he agreed to pay them a denarius for the day. Remember that? Remember verse 4? Go work in my vineyard and I will what? Open-ended phrase. And I will pay you what is right. Take your money and go. I paid you. All right, what's next? Okay, yeah. You're right. Yeah, okay. Um, don't I have a right, question number two, don't I have a right to be generous with my money? Watch what Jesus does there. He says, take your pay and go. So they have their pay, they have what kind of belongs to them, and they go. And then Jesus, okay, you're going to take your stuff, your little pay, and I'm going to take what belongs to me. I'm going to take my pay. And if I want to give to that first group what I gave you, can I do the same thing? I, uh, it's my money. Can I do what I want with my money? God's good gifts belong to him. And God can give them to his people in whatever way he chooses. He is no man's debtor, no woman's debtor. I can do what I want with my money. Rhetorical question number three as he concludes. Now this one, <laughs> we're really in the story. Are you envious because I'm generous? Are you resentful of my generosity? John, are you resentful? Anybody in the audience, are you resentful of God's generosity? Now we would never frame it this way. We would never say it this way. But it could come out like this. You know, I've <clears throat> grew up in the church. I've been around. It's like obedience. I've just been pretty faithful with this and that. My goodness. And you could say privately, I have borne the work all these years. I've borne the heat of the day, the op opposition and the criticism. Don't my years of service in obscurity count for something? Doesn't what I'm going through right now count for something? Doesn't what I gave up count for something? And it's a subtle, can I get a little more for what I put in, can I? And Jesus says, no. The kingdom of heaven upsets our heart expectation of reward. He does that in this parable. Now, as you think about that statement at the very end of the parable, Jesus says, so... The last will be first, and the first will be last. And I'm very aware that in our body here of Unionville Alliance, there's folks going through a lot of hard things. And this whole idea of rewards and work and comparison and envy, and I'm not trying to be trite or... But that first conversation with Peter in Matthew 19, 27 about rewards. Peter, yeah, there's this future time you're going to get rewards. And then Peter has another conversation. Let's call it the breakfast conversation. John chapter Jesus and Peter and John and there's this whole comparison and what am I going to get and Peter is there and feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep and at one point 
Peter says, what about John? What's he going to get? And Jesus says, Peter, don't worry about him. Focus on, our, focus on how I've called you. Someone said it this way. And by the way, in preparation for today, I've listened to a lot of different people. I've done stuff with commentaries, different authors. And all the good stuff, that belongs to them. And this is a good line that I got. And that is as it relates to this. You will never be content if your intent is focusing on what God is giving other people. You will never be content if your intent is always looking. And that is like a little hang it on on Twitter, whatever. How about a Bible verse? Peter, don't worry about them. Don't worry about them. Peter, stop trying to figure out where I've been merciful, gracious to other people and start focusing on what? On how faithful our relationship has been. And so the parable ends with that last statement. That what? That the first will be last and the last will be first. I close with this. In our present time, today, 2023, it would seem that our thinking and all the things that kind of keep us up at night, all those realities of living life today, yeah, they're just shaped by the things we're going through. And that those future rewards that Jesus talks about, it's out there. I get that. It's out there. There's a, a day coming when that will come. But oftentimes it's just too far away. And it's just, it's, it, when it's described, it's sort of in this poetic, sort of different kinds of images and language. I don't quite understand it all. And then Jesus would remind us, and he would say, There will be a glorious future that awaits those who follow, follow me. There will be that day. And when that day comes, you will get your reward. Wait for it. And those now who are last in the eyes of the world will be first when Jesus returns in power. That's our promise. Let's pray. Yeah, dear Jesus, uh, thank you for your word. You've kept this story about the workers in the vineyard for us all these years. You've preserved it. It's your word that pierces our heart. And you do know our hearts, Lord. And we're grateful that, uh, yeah, you don't dismiss us with a little rebuke when we ask you questions. But you're careful to affirm us, give us promises to build our confidence, at the same time you give us warnings. So we thank you. Thank you for how you have conversations to us specifically and encourage us as we seek to love and follow you. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.